Descartes to uh, Derrida. And um, we've got really two lectures uh, a week. We have a two hour slot from two till four. So I'll stop for 10 minutes from uh, five to three to five past three. Um, so the, the two lectures each week will be on separate topics. Um, in the University of Oxford, <coughs> lectures and classes are supposed to begin at five past the hour and five to the hour anyway, although they don't often do. Um, now, I don't know whether you're in the lecture yesterday, but I'll begin by just for a, about one minute duplicating how I began the lecture yesterday. Yesterday, I said that philosophy is the attempt to answer philosophical questions. And the philosophical question is a question that we have no method for answering. We might know the answers to some philosophical questions, but I won't go into that uh, now. So in um, biology or in physics or in history or in maths, we, we, by and large, know roughly how to proceed in problem solving. But in philosophy, we don't know. So philosophical problems are roughly those problems that can't be solved by other academic subjects. Um, now, philosophy, historically, uh, I think, has not solved any philosophical problems. But the reason for that is that... Um, when a technique of problem solving is invented, then a new science or kind of inquiry or discipline is born. I'll just, it doesn't mean that the problem has been solved, it means that a method has been uh, devised for addressing the problem. Now, I'll just give you one example of that. There are many, many. But in the, in the 17th century, um, it's a philosophical problem whether any knowledge is innate uh, or whether all knowledge is learned. In other words, it's a philosophical problem whether there's some knowledge that we're born with or whether, on the other hand, that view is false and all knowledge is acquired through experience or perception of the world. Now, that's, that's perhaps today 10% philosophical, that problem. But since the invention of genetics and since the discovery of the gene in the 19th century and since psychology becoming semi-scientific as an academic discipline, it's become, it's, it's become possible to address this question empirically or to put it another way, a set of methods have been uh, advocated or deployed to try to solve that to solve that problem. It doesn't mean to say that we solve the uh, problem. It doesn't mean to say we know the answer to the question. And as I said yesterday, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> we might know the answers to some philosophical problems. I mean, for example, supposing uh, you believe for good reasons that you are identical with uh, your immortal soul, and I believe for good reasons that I'm only a highly complicated physical object, and suppose just for sake of argument that we are all immortal souls, I would say that you know the answer to a philosophical question, uh, and what are we, or uh, uh, are we just complicated physical objects, or are we souls, something like that. Uh, in saying that you know uh, the answer to a philosophical question, I'm relying on a popular analysis of knowledge as justified true belief. Now, if philosophy is the attempt to solve philosophical problems, the history of philosophy, the history of philosophy is the history of the attempt to solve philosophical problems. And that's how I intend to um, treat these people from uh, Descartes to Derrida. Now, um, uh, in this, uh, in these Friday afternoons, I won't say very much about uh, history. I'll, I'll treat uh, Descartes, Leibniz, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, and so on as as though they were in the room with us, or as though they were colleagues in the uh, uh, philosophy department. Now, 
If we were doing the history of ideas, this would be an appalling thing to do, because in the history of ideas, you have to reconstruct carefully from within the thought world of the uh, individual relying on their letters and bits of biography insofar as we have access to that. But in doing the history of philosophy, as opposed to the history of ideas, we are interested in Descartes, Locke, Hume, Kant, and so on, insofar as they are philosophical problem solvers. Of course, we might be interested in some of the same problems that they're interested in, and they might have thought of problems that we've not thought of, but um, that's, if that's because they lived in the 17th or the 18th century, uh, that's a historical reason rather than a philosophical reason for our being interested in them, so we needn't pursue that. Now, um, the, the strategy over the next uh, 16 lectures, oh, that does sound like a lot, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. the, the strategy over the next 16 lectures is to look at movements in uh, philosophy, rationalism, empiricism, dialectic, uh, fundamental ontology, existentialism, deconstruction, and sort of perhaps postmodernism, and, and so on. Um, now, the, the, the reason why I've gone for movements, really, is that uh, each movement represents a cluster of problem-solving techniques. Insofar as one is doing philosophy, one is thinking up techniques of problem-solving. And um, there are no hard and fast rules in this, but informally there are clusters of problem-solving techniques. And these movements, practitioners of them disagree with uh, practitioners of other uh, movements. And there are even disagreements within the movements. Now, in the next uh, 40 minutes, or however long we've got left for this lecture, I'll tell you about uh, Descartes. Um, now, I'm not going to, I mean, by and large, I mean, I'll tell you that uh, Descartes was born in 1596 and died in. Uh, in, uh, in 1650 and was educated at uh, La Fleche, the Jesuit college in France. He's a very distinguished mathematician as well as a philosopher. But if you follow or agree with what I just said, none of that matters whatsoever. Right? That doesn't matter at all. Those are, those are, his, those are of, uh, historical interests, considerable historical interests, but none of them is a philosophical claim. None of them, except extremely tangentially, is a contribution to philosophical problem solving. Now, um, there's a large number of philosophical problems that Descartes is interested in, or which we can use Descartes to address. But there are two, <coughs> say, there are two philosophical problems which are salient in his work, or salient, saliently addressed by uh, Descartes. Um, one is uh, the mind-body problem, which is really a group of problems. And the other is, can anything be known for certain? Can anything be known for certain? Now, uh, I'll discuss these two problems, because we, we won't talk about many other problems at all, I don't think, because we, we haven't got that much time. But... The mind-body problem is a cluster of problems, or a group of problems. And they, I'll, I'll give you some questions which are ways of posing the mind-body problem. Number one, is the mind the brain? Number two, what exactly is the relationship between consciousness and the neurology of the brain. Number three, am I just a complicated physical object? Number four, um, what are minds? Do minds exist? <clears throat> right, so you understand the intuitive idea. Now the first thing about the mind-body problem to notice is whatever our preferences, whatever our preferences about the answer to this group of questions, 
the first thing to notice is that really we haven't got the foggiest idea how to answer these questions. We really haven't got the foggiest idea how to answer these questions. Now, to show how difficult it is, if you consider the brain, if you consider the brain, the brain is the most complicated mechanism that we know. Arguably, or allegedly, uh, the brain is more complicated than the known universe. It seems to me that that must be the known universe minus the brains in it, but never mind. Uh, the, the brain is more complicated than the known universe. Uh, but the brain, as we understand it normally, is a highly complicated physical object. A highly complicated physical object with a complicated anatomy and a complicated neurology. But what the brain boils down to, that sounds a bit horrific, isn't it? But what the, what the brain boils down to is billions of atoms in empty space. Billions of atoms in empty space. That's what the brain is. In the way that a rock is billions of atoms in empty space. Now, of course, the molecular structure is different. The brain is alive. The brain has the complex neurology that we're talking about. Now, the mind-body problem is that of seeing how your own consciousness, your own awareness, at least from when you wake up to when you go to bed, maybe when you're dreaming as well, but how your own awareness your own consciousness can be related to billions of atoms in empty space. One atom in empty space seems to be entirely physical. Three atoms in empty space seem to be entirely physical. Billions of atoms in empty space seem to be entirely physical. How on earth could that be, so to speak, connected with consciousness? Now, uh, there are various options in the philosophy of mind, or, or uh, I should say theories in the, in the philosophy of mind, designed to solve this uh, problem, but they're all quite awkward. Now, one uh, solution which Descartes endorses is mind-body dualism. Now, this is the doctrine that uh, nothing mental is physical, and nothing physical is mental. The mind is not the brain, and the brain is not the mind. Nothing mental is identical with anything physical, and nothing physical is identical with anything mental. Now, Descartes holds a special version of mind-body dualism. He thinks that the mind is the soul. The mind is the soul, and by the soul, he means an immortal consciousness, the immortal consciousness that you are, in his uh, view. And on the other hand, um, physical objects are substances, or they don't depend upon mentality in any way. So mind and body are independent of one another for their existence. On Descartes' view, there could exist physical objects if there were no minds. And on Descartes' view, there could exist minds if there were no physical objects. Now, Descartes, and this is Descartes' version of mind-body dualism. Now, there's, there are different kinds of mind-body dualism, or you can divide mind-body dualism up into different doctrines according to these differences. But... One uh, characteristic of Descartes' mind-body dualism is that Descartes thinks there is two-way causal interaction between minds and uh, bodies. He thinks that mental events are caused by physical events, and he thinks physical events are caused by mental events. Right? This is the important point about Descartes. Uh, two-way causal interaction. Hey, uh, some uh, mind-body dualists think that the causal direction is only one way. Some mind-body dualists think that 
uh, consciousness is caused by the uh, brain. Some uh, mind-body dualists think that brain states are caused by consciousness. Um, I mean, for, for example, most of the views today, uh, which are called physicalist, uh, are really mind-body dualist, but they include the view that conscious states are caused by the brain. But these are really dual, dualist views because mental states are still mental, even though they have physical causes. But on the other hand, Karl Popper and John Eccles, in their book, The Self and Its Brain, they think that neurological states are caused by states of consciousness. Now, this is, this is quite interesting because we can, we can wonder how, we can wonder, is there mental causation? And we can wonder, secondly, if there is mental causation, how is mental causation uh, possible? I mean, for example, it's a, it's a popular view, because it seems obviously true, um, that mental states depend upon the, on the, on the neurological state of the brain. It, it, it seems obviously right that mental states um, depend with some strength of dependence on neurological states of the brain, much as uh, vision depends on the well-functioning of the eyeballs and the optic nerves. And if you damage someone's eyeballs or optic nerves, you very likely damage their vision. If you damage somebody's brain, you cognitively Im impair them, depending on the part of the brain that you damage. It looks straightforwardly uh, right that states of consciousness depend on the brain. If something looks straightforward, you're right, I always think it's going to turn out to be false. It'll, it'll turn out to be false next year or in 500 years' time, but it will turn out to be false. One epoch's uh, obvious common sense is another epoch's uh, fallacy. It, I, it will turn out to be wrong once we have a, a, a quantum understanding of the brain. But we'll leave that on one side uh, for, for the moment. Now, Descartes thinks Descartes thinks that there is psychophysical causal interaction is uh, obvious. You might be wrong about that, but it's obvious to him. You know, from, it is obvious that P it doesn't follow that P. But it, and certainly from it's obvious that Descartes doesn't follow P. But, but Descartes thinks it's obvious that um, there's uh, psychophysical causal interaction. Uh, well, you, you've got to understand what Descartes, uh, what Descartes uh, means. Um, it looks as though physical things can affect brain states. I mean, people who uh, uh, who go along and drink bottles of wine in the Royal Oak on Woodstock Road at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon find that their mental state is altered by uh, this physical this physical activity, which involves glass and liquids and uh, tongues and things, things like that. It alters it alters, it alters, those, it alters those people's mental mental states. And uh, if someone stamps on your foot, the pain has some sort of phenomenology. Um, it's not, it, it is neurological, obviously, but it's got, it hurts, it hurts. There's a kind of psychological sensationalism to it. And uh, conversely, the mental seems to affect the physical. The mental seems to affect the uh, physical. I mean, if we're in the bunker in Afghanistan, and I say, um, uh, launch the drone now, uh, make it destroy the tractor now, or fire the cruise missile now. It looks as though priest's decision or motive or plan or strategy, which is all something psychological, has gone through his uh, neurology to the cruise missile and the zone and blown up the tractor or uh, whatever it is. So it, it looks as though mental things can affect physical things. These are clearly not examples that Descartes uh, uses, you wouldn't think that. But, 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 uh, but intuitively, this is the mind-body dualist version according to which there's psychophysical causal interaction. Now, uh, the intuitive uh, position, which might be wrong, seems, seems, seems to be that um, uh, that there is psychophysical causal, causal interaction seems obvious, seems right. How it happens, we've got no idea. 
How it happens, we've got no idea. Uh, one of the uh, Huxley family, it wasn't uh, Aldous Huxley, it might have been Julian Huxley, one of the uh, Huxley family said, well, how you get uh, consciousness out of the brain is as mysterious as how you get the genie out of the lab in the, uh, in the, in the myth, in the, in, the, in, the, in the story. How you get consciousness out of uh, 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 atoms in motion, in, in atoms in space. Uh, so we don't understand how that's uh, po possible. Um, uh, Gareth Evans, uh, possibly Wittgenstein before him, uh, thought that you don't move your arm through an effort of will. Uh, now, it seems like a remarkable uh, claim, um, because uh, where's the problem? These people must be philosophers or something. Of course I move my arm by an effort of will, you know, I want to move my arm, and uh, here we are. Uh, but what they mean is that you can't raise your arm by an effort of pure will. A sort of, hm, go on, arm, come on, come on, go on, arm, come on, come on. Somehow it doesn't work that way. Now, uh, with, perhaps with insight, Evans and Wittgenstein say, I raise my arm by raising my arm. I raise my arm by raising my arm. In other words, it's not the uh, effort of will that causes the arm to uh, raise. I raise my arm by raising my arm. Now, uh, on the other hand, it looks as though the motives and intentions um, uh, that we have do affect our physical behavior and the outside world. Um, Priest, why did you storm out of the room like that? Well, I felt humiliated after uh, my theory was refuted. You know, I, I couldn't stand it. I had to just storm out, storm out of there. Well, it looks as though the feeling of humiliation is the cause of the, the human being's motion um, out of the door. But we don't know. Uh, well, we don't really know what humiliation is in itself. It's something... Uh, uh, mental. Now, okay, so that's enough about mind-body dualism. Next, I'll mention another theory of the mind, which is uh, materialism. Now, materialism, um, as a global thesis, materialism is the view that everything is physical. Everything is physical. Uh, now, there are two strengths of materialism, strong materialism and weak materialism. Weak materialism uh, is the view that everything is physical. Strong materialism is the view that everything is only physical. Everything is only physical. Now, weak materialism entails that everything has at least one physical property or one physical characteristic, weak material, materialism, uh, precludes that possibility. S strong materialism is the view that all the things that we think of as mental, such as uh, memories of one's grandparents or uh, anticipating meeting one's friend at the train station or uh, images of, um, of uh, one's flat and so on, all, all this that we, that we think of as mental, is only physical. Um, there isn't anything mental. All that has to be re-understood as completely physical in every uh, detail. Now, in, since the 1950s, there's been a particular version of materialism that's been very popular and very influential. And this is the so-called mind-brain identity theory, the mind-brain identity theory. There was a hugely influential paper by U.T. Place, uh, Place as in space, not as in fish, U.T. UT Place, uh, called Is Consciousness a Brain Process, which appeared in the British Journal of Psychology in 1956. Now, Place, in um, Is Consciousness a Brain Process, says that consciousness is identical with um, a neurological state of the brain. Consciousness is identical with a neurological state of the brain. 
Now, there's something terribly important to notice about this materialism. Uh, this claim, consciousness is identical with the neurological state of the brain, is not the claim that consciousness is caused by the brain. It's not the claim that consciousness is caused by the brain. That's a mind-body dualist view, according to which there are mental states and physical states and uh, causal relations between the two. Place's materialism is quite different from that. It's the view that a state of consciousness is numerically identical with a neurological state of the brain. It's the very thing. It's not caused by it. It is it. Now, it's very important because, you know, when people talk about this, they entertain, they, they talk about um, views as though they were materialists and actually they're mind-body viewers. That's, uh, that's the problem. Now, um, a place says that this is a scientific hypothesis. Now, by this, it means two things. It means it's going to be confirmed or refuted by science. And by saying that it's a hypothesis, he means it's not a uh, definition. The word consciousness does not mean uh, the words brain state. And um, consciousness is a brain process. It's not any kind of necessary truth or anything like that. It's a contingent truth. In other words, um, if it's true, it could have been false. And if it's false, it could have been true. It doesn't have its truth value, essentially. Now, um, in saying that it's scientific, he means that the future progress of neurology, psychology, and maybe some other things, will confirm or refute his theory that consciousness is identical with, with a process in the brain. Well, um, uh, Obviously, empirically, we can correlate we can correlate states of consciousness with states of the brain. This is not hugely controversial, and this is an empirical uh, 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 matter um, using brain scans and so on, and um, uh, introspective reports by the subject, and finding out in which way the subject is cognitively impaired when the different parts of the brain are damaged. Uncontroversially, we can map different kinds of mental states or states of consciousness onto different parts, parts of the brain. But the trouble is that correlation, correlation is completely accepted by Descartes. The mind-body dualists all accept uh, um, correlation between mental states and uh, neurological states. Co the bare fact of correlation does not give us identity. It does not give us identity. And materialism requires more than correlation. It requires identity. Now, there's a further problem that this materialist view faces, which is um, there's a distinction between these two claims. Number one, A is B. And number two, A is only B. A is B, and A is only B. Now, it's one thing to say that consciousness is a brain process, A, but it's another thing to say that consciousness is only a brain process, A is only B. If you like, this is the distinction between strong and weak um, materialism. Now, if, you, if the materialist says, uh, oh, I'm a weak materialist, I think that uh, consciousness is a brain process, then we can ask, if we say that um, uh, we're, we, if we go with weak materialism and say that consciousness is a brain process, um, we can ask that kind of materialist, well, what is identical with a brain process? What is identical with a neurological process when consciousness is identical with a neurological uh, process? Now, if you say, well, 
uh, by consciousness, I mean the awareness that we have on an everyday basis, all our ideas and impressions and hopes and fears and regrets and so on, suddenly it looks as though we have mind-body dualism again. Perhaps not the soul, but a kind of property dualism. There are mental properties as well as physical uh, properties, and it suddenly becomes obscure again what the relationship is between them. Or put it this way, it's just, it's just as obscure for a materialist to say that consciousness is identical with uh, atoms in empty space as it is for a dualist to say that there are causal connections between consciousness and atoms in space. Now the third theory is idealism, but I'll leave that in case you stay for the next lecture because one of the philosophers who features in the next lecture is an idealist. I mean, we'll be talked about in the next lecture. He's uh, an idealist. But I mean, I'll just say now that <clears throat> idealism is the view that everything is mental and uh, um, unless consciousness exists, nothing exists. Um, and Idealism includes the view that physical things are all really mental. Um, and now, idealism and materialism are usually thought to be diametrically opposed philosophies because materialism is the view that the mental is physical. But uh, idealism is the view that the physical is mental, um, but I suggest a possibility horrendous to materialist and uh, idealist alike that they might be the same theory, um, because it's hard to see how the mental could be physical unless the physical is mental, and uh, vice versa, but we won't pursue that now. Um, now, there are some other theories of the mind, but I won't pursue those. We'll revert to Descartes. Now, Descartes arrives at <coughs> excuse me, his mind-body dualism through trying to answer the question, can anything be known for certain? Can anything be known for certain? Now, if you look at Descartes' very interesting book, called The Meditations, it's a very readable book, and a very profound uh, philosophy book. If you look at his book called The Meditations, he says that he's going to try to find out whether anything can be known for certain. Then he asks, well, what is it to know something for certain? Well, it's to know beyond the shadow of doubt. It's to know in a way <clears throat> that entails being incapable of doubting. So, roughly speaking, for Descartes, P is certain if and only if P cannot be doubted. I use P to stand for any claim whatsoever, any sentence or theory or belief, or anything that might be true or might be false. Now, his strategy then in the first meditation, there are six meditations, in the first meditation is to subject to doubt, subject to doubt everything that he thinks he knows. To subject to doubt everything that he thinks he knows. Now, depending on how you break things up in the first meditation, uh, Descartes doubts, firstly, the evidence of the senses. <clears throat> he thinks that there are hallucinations and deceptions. Um, so uh, it might be that anything that's perceived um, visually might be in some way misleading. So any belief arrived at through the five senses is in principle open to doubt, he thinks. Uh, secondly, but again it depends how you divide, divide it up, uh, Descartes doubts the existence of physical objects. Uh, when philosophers um, come up with this sort of thing, um, it, 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 it seems um, 
uh, bordering on insanity, um, but perhaps, um, well, philosophy does perhaps border on insanity. Um, but what, what they mean is that physical objects might not exceed our perception of them, or physical objects might not exceed your perception of them, or there might be no physical objects, so to speak, beyond uh, your perception of them. Uh, next, Descartes doubts the truths of mathematics and logic. He agrees there's you know, it's quite difficult to doubt sentences of elementary arithmetic, 2 plus 3 equals 5 or something, but he says sometimes we make mistakes in uh, mathematics and logic, sometimes a lot. Uh, therefore, there's room for doubt in these cases. Um, now, he's, fourthly, he doubts the existence of God. He doubts the existence of God. Now, he doesn't uh, doubt the existence of God in a way that would have been too offensive to the, uh, the, the, the church and the Parisian establishment of the time. He's, he says um, that there, there are people called uh, atheists, and so let us not go against them for the moment. But that's doubting the existence of God. That's as near as we get to doubting the existence of God in the, in the first meditation. So we can have God being uh, doubted. Um, now, it doesn't matter too much, but he has two techniques of doubting. Um, or, again, it depends how you, how you count them. Um, he has the fact that he might be dreaming all the time uh, as a technique of uh, doubting. And he has, he, he says that there might be an evil demon or some supernatural uh, deceiver who's causing him to doubt. Now, personally, in reading the meditations, I don't think Descartes actually needs the, the dream argument or the, or the evil uh, demon um, argument. It's just the case that it is psychologically possible to doubt something. Now, all that's in the first meditation. Now, in the second meditation, <coughs> he comes across something that he can't doubt. And he says, I am, I exist, is necessarily true every time I express it or conceive of it in my mind. I am, I exist, is necessarily true. There's no need to write down these quotations because they're in your email or in the room somewhere flying around. Uh, now, why is he not, in his opinion, why is he not able to doubt his own existence? Well, he says, I existed without doubt by the fact that I was persuaded, or indeed by the mere fact that I thought at all. Therefore, there is no doubt that I exist. There is no doubt that I exist. Now, we could put this in the form of a very brief argument, a very brief argument. The premise of the argument, we could label it one, is I doubt. And the conclusion of the argument we could label it too, is therefore I exist. I doubt, therefore I exist. Doubting is a kind of um, thinking. Doubting is a kind of thinking. So in another book, The Discourse on Method, Descartes writes, I think, therefore I am. I think, I, I think, Therefore, I am. Or, the discourse was written in French originally, je pense, donc, je suis. Je pense, donc, je suis. 
there's a Latin translation of it which has become famous. He says, cogito ergo sum. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Now this claim, I think, therefore, I am. Cogito ergo sum. What kind of claim is that? Is it a priori? Is it a posteriori? Is it some sort of empirical claim? Is it a necessary truth? Is it a contingent truth? Uh, can it be known with absolute certainty? If it is true, what does the word I refer to here? What does the word I refer to? Um, uh, uh, Bertrand Russell, following um, uh, Lichtenberg, says that, well, when Descartes says... Uh, I think, or I am, what we should really, what we should really understand here is that his sentence is like, it is raining, or, um, or uh, the weather's bad, or something like that. Uh, in other words, Descartes does not, Descartes thinks that thinking presupposes a thinker. Descartes assumes that thinking presupposes a thinker. And Bertrand Russell rejects this view. Russell is not alone. On various Buddhist doctrines of no self, there is thinking, but no thinker of the thoughts. On David Hume's philosophy of personal identity, there is a bundle of perceptions, uh, but there is no owner or subjective uh, thinker or haver of those um, perceptions. Now, Descartes says, I am, I exist, is necessarily true every time I express it. We can, we can ask, this, um, uh, I exist, is it necessarily true? I exist, is it necessarily true? Isn't that an extraordinary thing for anybody to say, for Descartes to say that I exist is necessarily true? I mean, in... In, in, in philosophy, uh, necessarily P means not only P, but not possibly not P. A necessary truth is not just true, but couldn't possibly have not been true, or couldn't possibly have been false, or neither true nor false. A necessary truth has to be true. Well, did it have to be true that Descartes exists? It might be that there's an equivocation in what Descartes is saying here. Um, we have to distinguish between these two positions quite closely. Um, no, this, this argument, I think, all right, number one, I think, number two, therefore I am. Now, we could put a necessity operator in front of that argument. We could try to, or with some plausibility we could. Then we say, necessarily, necessarily, I th if I think, then I am. But we have to distinguish that position from the position, uh, necessarily, I am. In other words, we have to distinguish that position from the modal status of the conclusion, uh, I am. It's harder to write box, I am, or box, I exist, I necessarily I am, or necessarily I exist, or uh, box, there is an X such that I am identical with X, or, or something like that. We could distinguish a third position where um, we write as a premise, I think, and we write as a conclusion, I exist. Uh, but we say, we insert the necessity operator before I exist, as conclusion of the argument. Now, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look right. It doesn't look right that I think, therefore, necessarily I exist. It looks more plausible to write, necessarily, I think, therefore, I exist. Now, in um, medieval philosophy, uh, based on certain ideas of Aristotle, it was customary to distinguish these two questions. Number one, is it? And number two, what is it? 
number one is it, and number two, what is it? Now, in many ways, uh, Descartes breaks with medieval scholasticism, but this is not one of them, because Descartes says that he has shown that he is, he has shown that he is, now he will inquire into what he is, or ask the question, what am I? Now, the, now Descartes says, I am not this assemblage of limbs called the human body, this is in the second meditation, I am not this assemblage of limbs called the human body. So, uh, it's not the case that I equals the body, or I equals my body. Now, the reason for this that he gives is you can doubt the existence, you can write this as an argument, number one, you can doubt the existence of your body. You can doubt the existence of your body. Number two, you cannot doubt your own existence. You cannot doubt your own existence. Number three, conclusion, you are not, brackets, identical with brackets, your body. Now, there's a, a huge uh, literature about whether this uh, argument is valid or not. Um, it seems to rely on a rather Cartesian assumption, a methodological um, assumption, which is that the following is true. I cannot doubt that P, therefore P. I cannot doubt that P, therefore P. Now, that principle in a philosophy seminar, we could say, is invalid. But from the fact that people are psychologically incapable of doubting things, it doesn't follow as a matter of logic that those things are true. I mean, I might be completely psychologically incapable of doubting that I'm a nice fellow. No, it doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it true at all. Um, but Descartes thinks that he's engaging in systematic doubt, and systematic doubt results in what Descartes calls clear and distinct ideas. This is a technical term in Descartes clear and distinct ideas. Now, he doesn't define clear and distinct ideas, this expression, uh, for us. But have a stab at understanding what he means. If you have a clear and distinct uh, idea of X, you distinguish X from non-X. Distinguish cleanly and sharply X from non-X. Secondly, X, your idea of X is complete in this sense. You know the essence of X. You know the essence of X. Now, what is the essence of X? Well, the essence of X is what X is. Um, not every feature of X belongs to the essence of X, but the essence of X is made up of those properties necessary and sufficient for being X, or those properties that one would have to mention in defining the term X, perhaps. Not a way of thinking that Descartes is particularly fond of. Um, well, that's rather a linguistic way of putting it. Now, Descartes thinks that he has a clear and distinct idea of his own existence as separate or distinct from the body. Now, it's pretty clear to me that in uh, the meditations, Descartes is engaged in logical thinking. He's trying to produce logical proofs. And it's also clear, secondly, that his method is systematic doubt. 
systematic doubt. And if you look at the secondary literature, much of which is really extremely well written and argued, there's uh, an analysis of his use of logic and his use of the methods of doubt. But there's a third thing that, med that uh, Descartes is doing in the meditations, uh, which is almost wholly neglected by the commentators. Uh, Descartes is meditating. And meditating here does not mean thinking. It means <clears throat> Descartes is involved in the spiritual practices that he learned at La Flèche from the Jesuits, including, for example, the practices of uh, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, according to which the mind is turned away from the senses and uh, allowed to reveal itself. The mind is turned away from the objects of the world and allowed to expose or disclose or reveal itself as the consciousness that it is. Now, there's an enormous secondary literature on Descartes, but there's almost room to write it all again for another 400 years based on the understanding that by meditation in the meditations, perhaps surprisingly, Descartes meant meditation. He meant meditation. Not just thinking, not just logic, not just doubting, all that's there. But he also meant the spiritual practices of Saint Ignatius of Loyola and other, other people who taught him. Now, in Descartes' meditation, he sets it out quite clearly. Now I'll turn my mind away from the objects of the uh, senses. Now I'll doubt everything that I've uh, believed and thought and, and so on. The result is the exposure of pure consciousness or pure uh, mind with uh, no body apparent. He loses awareness of his own uh, body. Now, you, you could, of course, um, say that um, it doesn't follow as a matter of logic from this that Descartes is not his body or does not depend on his uh, body. It could, you could argue that uh, from the fact that um, one's body disappears during this kind of uh, meditation, uh, it doesn't follow as a matter of logic that one's body uh, disappears. But I think from a Cartesian point of view, i.e. from Descartes' point of view. From a Cartesian point of view, this is a prejudice based on our conditioning over the decades, or our um, partial understandings of science. Now, ever since uh, Descartes wrote, his work has been attacked, I mean, roughly speaking, by all the other movements in philosophy in the list of 16 lectures, Descartes is the villain. When someone is vilified to this extent, I take it as a hint that there might be something in what he's saying. But, um, we'll break for 10 minutes. All right? um, I wouldn't mind a cup of coffee from somewhere. I might go to the refectory.